Hello, I'm uh, Jonathan Pickering, and this is a demonstration of Gluviz. So we'll start out with some introductions. Um, so I was originally a material scientist. Um, I worked as a research metallurgist for several years and then did a computer science retraining course um, and then went on to do a PhD uh, in application of artificial intelligence to computer graphics. Um, since then, I've had a number of teaching and research posts and I've worked in industry for a while. Um, for the last seven years, I was working in Leeds on um, computer modeling uh, for the pharmaceutical industry and fine chemicals, associated fine chemicals. And now I work in the computer science department at the University of Leeds. So uh, Gluviz, right. So Gluviz was originally developed by astrophysicists um, and they have basically fairly complicated data. And often they're joining up data from multiple files. So they've got, they want to, they've got some star catalog viewed from a telescope, they've got the same catalogue seen from a radio telescope and they want to join them together. Um, the big problem that you have in a lot of data is that it's um, heterogeneous. Uh, it doesn't naturally fit together. So if you start out, the stuff you did at school, you've got temperature against time in some experiment and it's pretty easy to plot it. But you know, you might have um, temperatures, if you take, say, um, the weather, uh, you might have temperatures recorded um, hourly, while rainfalls are recorded daily. Um, you've got things like in economics, uh, the, the average income of a pop, average income distributions in a population, and you've got average school leaving age. One is, one is a number of currency units the other is an age so you want to combine these not naturally easily fit in data and that that's that's where the glue in glue is comes from the idea was that you could link these things together when you're linking something you're gluing it it's it's, it's as simple as that um, another feature of glue is is that it allows you to define subsets within your data and it, it what is known as brushes them through from one so if you have multiple visualizations up if you define a subset in one visualization it will brush it through to all the other visualizations um, so some basic background here um, the way we've had, uh, asked you to get glue is, is by installing anaconda um, it isn't the only way you can get it via, if you've got Python and PyPy, you can get it that way as well. Um, Anaconda is, for those of you who don't know, um, essentially a package manager. It's, it was originally sort of built around Python, but it does a lot of other things other than Python um, nowadays. So you can actually get things like um, the GNU compilers. You get the GNU Fortran and things via Anaconda. And you can get a lot of packages like um, Gluviz. Um, Anaconda, it's available in Windows, Linux, and Mac. There isn't um, a, um, a Google version of it yet uh, for, for Chromebooks. Um, it does, I mean, sometimes if you want the most advanced package, the most up-to-date package of all uh, for a software product, it may not be an Anaconda because they've got to get it integrated with everything else before they can release it. The other thing you can do with Gluviz is you can program it. In computer science, there's a term called orthogonal, which doesn't mean being at 90 degrees to each other as it does in maths. 
it means when you've got computer commands, you can connect them together, the output of any one follow going into the next one. When you construct a user interface, you, you hide that away behind buttons and essentially you produce canned can transactions, which are what we what the design of the user interface is guesses are the most useful ones for the users fitted to buttons. Um, now, if you're just doing one type of data, uh, like a classic would be a spreadsheet doing accounts, that's going to work brilliantly. If we get into this complicated world of heterogeneous data, it's going to create problems. It just limits on what you can do. Um, so Gloovis provides a means by which you can program it. You can either open a terminal within Gloovis and do your Python programming within Gloovis itself, or you can create Python scripts and um, do the pro call the Gloovis libraries, load the data, manipulate the data, and then call Glo and then run Gloovis itself and display the data that you created. Um, it, 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 it handles generally the sort of default source are the various astro astrophysics file formats and comma separated values. Uh, but if you program it yourself, you can obviously um, use the Python um, libraries for reading Excel files and any other files that you've got a, a Python reader for. Um, it certainly is possible, though I have done it myself, to store very large data files uh, on the cloud and then link to that and pull down only the parts of the data file that you actually need. Um, there are Python libraries that will let you do that. So um, I think the best thing to do here is rather than just go through these slides describing um, Gloovis, I'll start Gloovis and show you that, which seems more sensible. So this is uh, Anaconda, an Anaconda PowerShell. So to start it, first, uh, the Gloovis environment I created. So one basic feature with Anaconda is that you work in environments and you, in an environment, you download, you, you download the software packages you need for the job you're doing. Uh, you will always have a, an environment called base available. And <clears throat> the automatic thing to do is just, uh, well, I'll work in base, I'll download everything into base. If you do that, eventually things stop working. You just have so many things downloaded into your base that um, something conflicts and oddball things happen and things stop working. So it is best to create an environment for each thing, separate thing project you've got and activate those environments so that you keep them separate. So I've got an environment called Gloovis where I install Gloovis. Now I just start glue. This might take a, a few seconds to start up. Um, <clears throat> okay, so while we're waiting for this to start up, I've got to stop sharing that and share the right thing now. Where's glue is? Oh, there it is. So that's the main screen. That's as it were the home for glue is. Um, right, some a few warnings. It is a free software package, so it isn't as refined as commercial software. And there are some things that can go wrong. I'll try and warn you about them. The first thing is the areas. So when, when, when you import data files in, they appear here. And when you create subsets, they appear here. Um, this area here, Will become, it'll become clearer when, when I do some work with it. But this is where the different components in, in the plot that you are currently looking at appear. And down here are various options about coloring and so forth that you can control your plots. 
Over here, you have the plotting area. And essentially, the idea is that you drag data into the plotting area. Um, you can have multiple tabs to um, divide up different things that you are doing with your data, but it doesn't seem a lot of effort worth doing that. So we can import data. You can import from here or here. And what I'll do is I will show you something that isn't in the course first, which will give you a sort of idea of it. Um, so this is um, a relatively, a moderately famous geographical data set. It's uh, taxi data from New York City. So it's a record of um, some weeks uh, data from the New York taxi companies of what their taxis were doing. And it will take a few seconds to load. Um, so we're waiting for that to happen. Does anybody have any urgent questions so far? I will open another one. Um, I was ready. I thought we might get this. This is a, this is a new PowerShell. Um, so what, what happens with an environment is um, going to work. Yes. So what I've got here is, is a series of these, these are the environments I've got. Um, if you read the the installation script, it describes how to do this. You you each environment is actually a separate programming environment. So what happens is in base, if I type glue, which is the norm, which is the the command I use to type to start glue, is it just says it's not there. I can't find this instruction. Um, if I conda Um, I activate the, the environment glue viz. Um, I'll, I won't type it because I've already started it. Which, so, oh, doesn't know, know which, but um, oh, sorry, that two running. It will now start glue. It's it's happily, um, you won't be able to see it here, but it's happily boosting the second copy of glue viz up. So I'll close that one off. Um, so basically, each environment, it's, um, it's like having a different setup for your computer. It stores different software relative to your environment. Does that make sense? Um, it's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a separate path. You can change directories and run programs in anything like with a normal shell tool. It's just that when you've created an environment, you, your shell tool will have um, the software tools that you've downloaded for that environment and only that environment. So if you have some really old Python program that only works with Python 2.7, you can create a Python 2.7 environment in which the only Python available is Python 2.7 and run your, um, your old program using this archaic version of Python, and it'll be totally separate from anything else you're doing. That's the idea of environments. Okay, so um, we've got here, it has finally appeared. It was a common separated value file, so I have to read a lot of text. But here we've got our taxi data, and the simplest way to get started is just to drag it in here and drop. And we get a series of options here. Um, you can, let's try a table view and you see the data. So essentially this is just exactly the same as you'd see in a spreadsheet. Um, there's the vendors, the number of passengers, the distance, 
uh, pick up and drop off longitudes and latitudes. And one important thing, when you go full screen on this, you might you, it's completely fill the tab. The maximize, minimize, and kill are here. These very small ones here. So um, to get it back, you have to use those. When it's not full screen, you've got them there, and you can shrink it down there. Now, I said I'd warn you about Gluviz's peculiarities. There is a bit of a peculiarity that quite often when you kill one of these views, glue will bail out. It'll just quit on you. Um, so if you've done something wrong, just minimize it. Don't quit. Um, because quite often if you click that, if you click the kill, it will crash Gluviz on you. Uh, another thing, because we because it is, you know, you can crash this software. Uh, you can use export session. It will call it session glue. Um, better give it a number. Oh, one. Uh, and I'm going to save it there. So when when you save the session, um, you can you can restart glue and reload that session, and it will re reopen all the windows, all the data analysis you've done before. Um, finally, uh, you can open the sessions again from here. When you do the export, Okay, it's done it right. When you do the export, you can, if you do it from the from the file menu, you get some options about whether you want to save it with relative file names. So all the file names are relative to where you're actually running Gluvis from. Absolute file names, in other words, everything's from C colon whatever, or store all your data in the session file. If you do that, you can move the whole session file around, but obviously the session file is gonna get huge because you've stored all the data in it. So, oh, one thing you have is of course, the yellow, the plot layer now has the trip data. So we'll do this again, and this time we'll take a 2D scatter plot. Right, and we don't see very much. Uh, it's not particularly, there's just some dots here. So we have to go to the commands over here and we see X axis and Y axis. And of course, there's a lot of data in that, in that file, there's all the columns. So we'll, we'll take drop off longitude and drop off latitude and way hey, we have something now and you can probably make out Manhattan Island there with Central Park in the middle um, you can use this to magnify things for those of you who've worked with Python before and this if this looks familiar it's because it's the matplotlib uh, all the Gluviz tools are built over the matplotlib tools. Um, so that they're, they're, they're derived from that. So what we've got is a lot of dots. Each dot represents a, a drop-off point for a taxi. And, um, okay, you can see Manhattan Island. A lot of people in Manhattan use taxis. We shrink that down. We can now make a second, we'll have a look at this again. And there's, I'll choose a histogram this time. So, okay, there's a histogram, we've got vendor ID and number. So we've got basically two vendor IDs, not very interesting. I think what we're gonna look at is the fair amount, which is how much it cost. So I'll expand that up. So we've got a histogram now 
obviously uh, quite why some people are actually getting negative values, I don't know, but um, we don't want to look at that. So we'll say for the lower, the lower limit is zero. So that's got that there. There's obviously quite a large tail going up here. Probably not very interesting. So we'll cut it off at about $80 looks like the upper limit on the interesting stuff. Right. So we've got a spike here, which you just kind of expect a lot of people take short taxi journeys. And there's a kind of another spike here. Uh, maybe we could increase the number of bins to look at that. Okay, so we probably, to cut this down further, let's put a, fair, a minimum fare in of 40. See how that looks. Ah, oh, right. Now we've definitely got, we're just looking at the fares between 40 and $80, and we've got a very definite spike here. What I'm going to do is create a subset for this spike. So we, select, we go to select the range and we're going from about what, 50 to 55. So it pops in there and it's created a new subset and it shows you subset one there and it shows you subset one there. If you click on this, you can actually see the internal of the subset there. So we've got We've created a subset. I'll shrink this one down and open, I hope it's a scatter plot. Yes, the scatter plot. And now you see brushing in action. Um, the, the dots that are in the subset have appeared in the scatter plot. And there's um, a load here and there's a load over here. I'm, I'm gonna give you the fact I knew in advance that at the time this was done, the standard fare from um, JFK Airport to Manhattan was $52. And so that down there is JFK Airport. This over here is obviously Manhattan. And you're seeing the business people shooting between Manhattan and JFK. You can, if you want, using the plot layers, turn off the, back, the, the original data and just show the subset or you can turn the subset off and put the original data back on. So you can use that to control what you're seeing. What you're seeing on this one is only the drop-off. So you're not, you're seeing uh -huh. where the taxi dropped the customers off at. If you look in the data set, um, the original data set, it has pickup and drop-off longitudes and latitudes. So, you could, um, you'd have, you, this is where programming would help you, but if you wanted to visualize actual average routes and things, yes, you can do that, but you would need to do a bit more. Um, you probably need to do something for the programming interface to do that. I should also tell you now that there is um, a geospatial plugin for Gloovis. There are various plugins that can upgrade it and um, I, it didn't seem to work very well in Anaconda. It might work better in PyPy, but if you use that, you can uh, superimpose this over satellite images and so forth. Um, but I, I wasn't able to get that to work in Anaconda. So if we take our data here and we drop it in, um, Going to produce a scatter plot again. Um, so, if we we do pick up longitude, so going from the question that was asked, pick up latitude. So now we've got the data. So this is the subset on its own only showing its pickup longitude and pickup latitude. So what I'm gonna try and do is get the subset of data that picked up at JFK. So again, I'm gonna to have to make the whole thing a bit smaller because some of the Zoom command bars are hiding stuff. So what we have to do is go to the active subset 
and get that to be subset one. And um, I want to intersect. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new, I'm going to create a new subset and intersect it with subset one. I'm going to reduce, as it were, subset one by intersection. So I select intersect and I now do the, the square and I now select only those pickups. So those are the ones that picked up at uh, JFK. So if we shrink that down, we go back to the original, right? So we've, we've eliminated those that appeared at JFK. What you now see is that there's very few pots, spots over here. They're mostly showing up in Manhattan. So we've kind of reduced things to what's on the island of Manhattan, which is the best way I can work it out to try and show uh, as quickly where things are from going to. Uh, the, the key point here is that you can use these buttons here to modify your subset once it's created. If it's, say, an age of something, you can sel select it in an age. If you've got, I mean, if you went to the taxi cab one here, uh, I'll bring it back up. If you go to the, the table here, you've got somewhere on here, you've got, uh, you've got say payment type which is one or two for whether it's credit cards or things you can okay. select a certain payment type there's the vendor id so this is the the ids of the different taxi cab companies mm -hmm. you could you you could select only a particular id if you're working through the, pro the programmable interface if you had um some sort of data field that was a string you mm -hmm. could do a uh, pattern matching on the string selecting strings that only contain certain substrings and things. If you wanted to create um, uh, a complete new subset, uh, what you do here is you go to none, create new. And then you would, um, on this, just draw, I'm going to take the southern end of Manhattan for this subset, and you can draw that. And now you've got subset two. If I turn off subset one and everything else, else is just the southern end of Manhattan. I seem to have picked up a bit of, I think that's Queens. Um, but that's how you create a complete new subset. But you can't use, um, as far as I can see anywhere, I've never found a way of doing it. You can't use these buttons up here to intersect different subsets. So you pick a subset and then you can do the intersection operations on it. But what you can't do is um, having created two different subsets, intersect them via the user interface. You can, you could do that via the programmable interface. If you've got, it do, Glue itself, I don't think handles Excel, but there is an Excel reading package in Python. By the end of this course, you will be able to write a, a, a script that will use the Python Excel package to, to load it. You can load data from anything you can connect to to Python using the programmable extension by, by programming it yourself. If you've got a package or you've written a package that gets certain data format into Python, then you can get it into Gluviz. So that's enough of the demo. I think it's, it's best at this point that I'll go, what I'll do is I'll go off and I'll work you through the sheets. I assumed no knowledge of Python program or anything. So the sheets are very basic. I'll show you how to do something. You then copy what I've, ba what I've basically showed you following the description on the sheet and Hopefully you learn a bit about how this works and you're able to gauge whether it's what you want to do. All right, so you should be again seeing uh, Gluviz. So if we do 
import data. And this is the, the data. The first one is W5 fits, which is astronomical data. So we can drag it in here and we can just, because it's a fits, it knows it can select an image and it's not fit. Oh, there it is. It's running a bit slow today. So it produces a, a 2D image. Um, it uses right ascension and declination, which is astronomers speak for um, uh, X and Y in the sky. Uh, so there are various things you can do with this. It, you can change, um, you can try different ways of scaling it, which is a nice result. Um, there are various different color schemes you can use. You can, it's best to drag this over here a bit, but you can also adjust the, cons the contrast a bit. Which is why it's best to. Uh... Oops. So your your first exercise is, as it were, to get this far to get something up that looks um, like this and play with it a bit. Just get um, try and repeat that. Right, so the next exercise is create a subset. So we, can, we don't have to worry about anything else now. We just go here and select rectangle and I'll pick a nice big chunk here. Right, so I've created a subset. Now, important warning here. The glue, you'll see on the Gluevis website that you're supposed to be able to hold down the control key, click on the subset and drag it around the screen. In the Conda version I've got here, that is very badly broken. Um, it just shoots off down to the corner. Try it at your own risk, but uh, it, it's probably, it looks like a feature that's broken. The next thing is make sure your subset is selected here. Select remove from selection. And if you now create a, a circular subset here, it chops it out of your original subset. So you haven't created a new subset. What you've done is this, you've edited this one down. So I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of minutes to just try that. You have to go here and make sure the active subset is subset one. On these controls here, pick uh, pick one of the ways of defining a subset. I use the circle. I'll do it again. Click down and draw your circle so it intersects the, the first rectangular subset you drew. Let go and it should chop it out. So long as that there was set to remove from selection, the circle should basically cut down the original subset. That's what we're trying to do. So on one of these two, I can't remember which one. I think it's this one. Edit style, um, color. Uh, what do you think is gonna work better here? Blue uh, or a green maybe? Click OK. Yeah, is that is that better? Is that showing up? Again, I'm not sure. We're, we're going to adjust the transparency a bit, just to remind you. You right. This is just to remind you that you should be exporting because things glue. It is free software. It is a bit flaky. It can crash on you. So we we want to. Um, export and down here I didn't show you before 
these are the ways that you can export it. If you include all the data, obviously you can move that around from computer to computer, but the file is going to be massive. Um, but um, it, it's best to regularly export your data as you go along so that if you do crash it, um, you, can, you can restart where you, at the last saved point. That saves the image. Um, it's also, you can also create, the image will be saved as a JPEG. You can also create a Python script to reproduce the plot. The Python scripts, it, it, the machine generated Python, it, it's quite helpful with all the comments, but it doesn't always run. So you might have to um, play with the Python a bit to get it to run. Okay. Right, I'll shrink this down. And this time we're gonna look at the subset only. We drag the subset in here to the image and we'll pick a histogram. So that is the histogram of, of just the, your subset as before. Um, you can play with this histogram. You can set the, you probably want to play with it, get rid of that tail at the top. That looks more healthy. Um, a few more bins. It's good. So that's just getting you to, to use one subset. Right, this is an important point to note here is if I open this one, um, so if I have both of these on the screen at the same time, when I click in one, things over here change. So what's over here is determined by what plot you're looking at. So the plot layers and the plot options change as you, depending on which you've selected here. Um, just note that. So if we go to here and we select that subset one is active. So now we're gonna, sub and we select intersection here. We can select this, I'm gonna use the histogram to select this peak here and, and get rid of some of the other stuff. So I go to select here, subset one, intersection, select, and we'll take those peaks there. And you now see over here on this one that the new reduced subset is automatically appearing. So this is what I was talking about by uh, when I was talking about brushing. Um, I've brushed through the changes I created in the histogram. They instantaneously appear in the image. So if you want to try something like that, I'll, I'll give you a minute or so to do that. Um, okay, and the next thing is um, to create, you now got this small subset, create a subset of the subset. So for that, um, we go to create new. Um, and I'll use this selector again, just to lop off that tail part there. So I've now created a new subset, subset two. So if we open this up, you can see some of it has turned green. It's probably not showing up very well. Uh, I will turn off subset one. So there's subset two in green. 
if I turn off the primary, note that subset two, because it's not intersected or anything with subset one, it selected that range of intensities right across the whole image. It wasn't limited to the data in subset one, it went on the whole data set. Um, so that's the difference when you're when you're using that controller at the top, when you when you select a subset, you the you work only on the subset. When you go to create new, you work on the whole original data set, even if the actual plot or visualization you're working on is a subset. So you can create a subset, see something interesting in that subset. And you can select that something interesting in the subset, and you'll also select that something interesting thing right across the whole of the data set. So I'll, I'll leave you to play with that for a minute or two. Right. For this, I've got a couple of extra slides that I, I did earlier. So I'll stop sharing now. We're going to talk about linking. This is a little bit about basically data. This is uh, relational databases in two slides. You can think of it that way. So um, I've got some Python, some example Python code here. Um, firstly, off you can think of data just as single values. So we can have a number uh, eight point oh nine. Give it a, assign it to a variable n or we can have a string called Harry, which we assign to name. That's pretty straightforward. And then you can have arrays and lists of things. So you can have a, a 1D array, which is just these times, or you can have a two-dimensional array, which works like a matrix. I've called it ID matrix. Um, and then we can move on to a more advanced thing called dictionaries. Um, and in a dictionary, it's, it's basically a list, but instead of in an array, you would index things by their number. In a dictionary, you have some sort of object, usually a string as your key and, and a value. So we've got two, so we've re represented locations this way. And of course you can, com you can put arrays into dictionaries. So here we've got a dictionary where we've got time, and we've got an array of times and temp, and we've got an array of temperatures. Um, and you can obviously see how we're going here. We're constructing tables. Um, we're automatically constructing the tables that we use. Um, and this is how this is how Gluviz works internally. These dictionaries are how it ultimately reads its data in. Um, it's also uh, frankly, how a lot of things like spreadsheets work. Uh, the issue is how do we join up difficult data, which was the question that was asked just before, how would you connect your taxi cab data across cities? And this takes us to the interesting thing of relations between different data sets. And this is, if you've heard the term relational database, this is where the relation comes from. So we're gonna do, you know, this is pretty much, if you've done databases, databases 101, um, uh, a hospital. Hospital has patients who each have a number. So uh, we have a, a, a table of patients and each patient is given a number and so forth. Pretty straightforward. And we have staff. We want to record our staff. So we have a staff and each staff's got a staff number. Now, it's important in the hospital that you record every um, visit of a staff member to a patient is recorded. We've got to record that. So where do you do it? Uh, do you do it in the patient? Mm, how would you get all the patients who've been visited by a particular doctor easily? You just have to search all the patients you basically ever had. Do you do it in the staff number? Well, that's great, but 
how do you get all the visits by to a particular patient? You just have to sort search all your staff. And the obvious and simple answer is to create a third table um, that is a relationship between these two, which in which you have staff no, patient number and the medic number and the time and date of the visit, because you need to record that data. So this is called a, a relationship in, in relational databases. And an awful lot of the power of databases comes from this relationship. And there's even a whole uh, algebra of relations being defined. But you'd have to do that. In Gluviz, this is called linking, and it allows you to link different types of data together. And the basic approach is that you take, as it were, a column in one data set, a column in another data set, and you, you join them together, possibly with a, a function for joining them. So we're going to go and do that with our astronomical data now. So I'll, I'll put... So the trick is we've got to import some more data. Import data. It's gone to the previous. Um, so what we want here is W5 underscore PSC bot. And we can open that. Okay, so that's appeared here. Right. The key here is the link data button is what's going to link these things and you get this um, rather complicated looking screen so you can see your two data sets over here as green dots and there's nothing connecting them so what you have to do is write ascension first so you you select from your original you select write ascension and over here it's R A J two thousand. So these are the these are essentially the same data, and click blue attributes. And now you see your your connections appeared over here. Uh, there's a line joining these two data sets to show you've linked them. If you don't like the link, you can get rid of it here. If you want to change it, you can change it here. You can modify it if you've got the wrong data set. And just to show you, there is an advanced link here. And this would give you various functions that would allow you to um, connect slightly different data sets together. Um, we'll deal with that in the last exercise. So we now need to connect declination to DJ2000 and glue those and you get a second link here so that's declination dej2000 and we're happy we can click okay we've now linked the two together no they they don't they don't have to you, <clears throat> they can have missing data yeah they'll just match where they match Right, so uh, let's try what I have to do here. So drag, to, drag this in and um, create a 2D scatter. Right. And you've got the two sets. You've got um if you now I've click on the, the subsets that were oops. 
טובה איתנו בו. Okay, I've made a mistake here somewhere. Sorry. I better just check. I linked it okay. If it all, it could be that I have actually selected such a small range here. That I will create a new subset. Right, so that's subset three. We'll see if subset three is appearing. Ah, right. Okay. I'd created such a small subset that um, it didn't actually have any members in the data I just, in the new data I'd loaded. So that's proof of the, my answer to the previous question was right, that they don't actually have to completely align. But um, what you can see now is that the subset I've just created on the original data appears in this data. So I suppose you want to see it go the other way. If I create a subset on here, have I been, oh, I know what I've done. I've done it in the wrong mode. This is why the modes are so important. Um, I've done it on an intersection that didn't intersect. Let's take yet another subset. Oh, I've done it. In, I've done it again. I'm going mad here. Create new. So we're definitely creating a new subset this time. Right. And I'm having trouble here because the Zoom controls are hiding my um, parts of Gloovis. So we'll go create new on this one. And we'll take a chunk over here. So we've got, we created a subset in the W5PSC data. If I shrink that down, that's appeared over here. We've got a lot of subsets appearing. It appears we've got nothing. Oh, damn. Right. Anyway, uh, if you want to try this for yourself, Hopefully it'll be a bit easier for you because you're not getting your controls hidden by um, Zoom things. Um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to have a go at that.
final stage of this is to, you can uh, show you how to adjust the size of your points. Um, So you can increase or decrease the size of your points here. You click OK. So that's made the points very large. Um, and I have to adjust. And if you click here, you get the ability to save data. So you want to save it. W5, because it's an, basically an image, you only get this thing primary, but with the PSC, which you can save all the data you want, um, or you can select out the ones from here that you want to save. You can save it. There are various mainly astronomical formats here, but you can, I'm asking you to save it as a comma separated file. So if you click export, um, type in my test or something. Don't test, don't forget the comma separated CSV for comma separated value. You should now have wherever you stored it a file my test, which you can open in Excel. I'll open it in a text editor just to show you quickly what it is. So that's just in a, a text editor. It's just saved it as a whole list of numbers uh, plus the column headers. Um, and you can open that. You can open this in Excel or Origin, uh, MATLAB, pretty well anything will read comma separated values. We'll call it quits there for the moment.